artifacts and shipwreck sites is a big problem in Florida and has been for a large part of our history. Um, souvenir collecting is also something um, similar, but we kind of distinguish it. Souvenir collecting is people wanting to go to an archaeological site or dive on a shipwreck and take something home with them. Um, completely, you know, innocent in their motives of doing so. They just want something to remember their cool dive by. But over time, if everybody who visits that site takes something, we're, lo we're not left with much else to study as archaeologists, as researchers. And we're not left for other things for people to go and see. And of course, there are other impacts. Um, people who have poor buoyancy control when they're diving can accidentally tear off parts of shipwrecks. Uh, erosion is also a problem in coastal areas, as is development. Uh, but what I wanted to come here tonight to talk about is to give a little intro about shipwrecks, but also to talk about some of the really amazing archaeological sites that we have here in the Pensacola area. And so I'm going to talk about sites in Pensacola Bay, but also some sites that are just outside of Pensacola Bay in the Gulf of Mexico. And of course, some of the most iconic shipwrecks that we have here in Pensacola are what we call the Emanuel Point Shipwreck. And so these are... Um, the remains of a fleet, let's see, we'll go to the next slide here. They are the remains of a fleet from the very first European settlement attempt in what is now the United States. Right. So in 1558, or 1557 rather, the Spanish crown decided, okay, we've explored the southeast area, we're ready to establish a settlement here. So that way we can block the English and the French from encroaching on our very important shipping lane that goes around the Straits of Florida. So they decided that they would settle in Pensacola. And the reason that they chose what is now Pensacola was because of previous expeditions to the area. They knew the Pensacola area had a deep water bay. They knew there was a fairly protected path to get into Pensacola. Oop, it's just off to the side here. Um, and so they felt that this area was very well protected for their ships and for a potential new settlement. And so 11 vessels with 1,500 people came from Veracruz, Mexico, flying under the Spanish crown. They came here to northwest Florida, what would eventually become Pensacola. Those 1,500 people included armed guards, so they included military men, but they also included indentured servants from Mexico. They also included men, women, and children families who were coming here to establish this settlement. It wasn't a purely military exercise. They really wanted to get a foothold here. So they came in, they landed here in August of 1559. One month later, I'm sure you know how the story goes, there's a terrible storm, right? That's the story of Pensacola, really. There's a terrible storm. They had 11 ships. They'd been here one month. They didn't have time to build permanent structures on land. So most of their supplies were being stored on the ships. And when that major storm came through, it wrecked most of those ships in Pensacola Bay. And we know this from historical records. Um, on those ships, uh, like I said, were most of the supplies. And when the ships went down, they lost most of their supplies, which were primarily foodstuffs, right? They were coming to establish a settlement. They didn't have any agriculture yet. That, or, uh, they had some pigs that they had brought and cows, but it was not enough to sustain them. Right? They hadn't really built themselves into the land yet. And so when those ships sank, they lived along for about two years until they finally gave up on Pensacola and refocused their settlement attempts in what is now St. Augustine area. And that was under the leadership of Menendez. Um, so, in 1992, the Florida Bureau of Archaeological Research was doing some survey in Pensacola Bay and stumbled upon a large iron object in the water. When they went to go dive on that target, they realized that it was part of a large uh, iron anchor. It was the fluke of an anchor sticking out above the sand. And upon further investigation and seasons of field work, they finally determined, based on the archaeological record and on historical documents, that this was a shipwreck of the Tristan de Luna fleet from 1559 that had been wrecked. Um, that was in 1992. We knew from historical records that there were more ships out there that had been sunk by the storm, and so the search continued. In 2006, a second shipwreck was identified, and in 2016, a third shipwreck was identified. So as of today, we have three shipwrecks related to the Luna expedition. And on the map here, uh, the red X is approximately where those shipwrecks are located. But the story gets even kind of more fun, in 2015, a location on land was potentially identified as being the site of the Luna settlement. And 
sure enough, after investigation by UWF and several seasons of field work, we now believe that that is the location of the Luna settlement. So we have the shipwrecks not far offshore of the settlement in the East Pensacola Heights area. And again, that's one of the most unique combinations of archaeological sites anywhere in the continental U.S. We don't have both a land and underwater site for a colonial settlement anywhere else. A very unique thing that we have here. Um, some artifacts from that shipwreck. Barbara, please make sure I'm staying on time, too. I don't want to go over. Okay. Well, I don't want to. You have things you get. Um, some images here from uh, the first shipwreck. Where they are in Pensacola Bay is not known for its beautiful visibility underwater, so you have to forgive the photos. Uh, the site is located just off of Three Mile Bridge, or Chappy James Bridge now. Um, this is an older photo when we had our research platform out there. It did not, uh, yeah, you've probably seen it out there if you've been here for some time. The platform didn't make it out again this year, but hopefully it'll make it out next year. Uh, this is a good day of visibility of diving on the site. So you can see the ballast stones sticking out above the sediment there and some, some fish. Can't tell if they're sheep's head, but something swimming above the water there. So we have uh, good visibility here, maybe three feet. Um, and then what you're seeing here is a picture, not a very good picture, uh, because of visibility of the main mast step. So this is where the main mast of the ship would have sat. Um, the shipwreck itself is in about 13 feet of water. So it's a perfect place for University of West Florida maritime archaeology students to cut their teeth on underwater archaeology. It's shallow, it's a little dark, uh, but it's very good experience on a really cool site. Some of the artifacts, um, again, the preservation here is excellent because of where it is in Pensacola Bay at the outflow of several large rivers. Um, we find things like uh, olive pits from 1559. Uh, we found a mortar, mortar and pestle uh, here, which has been conserved and is on display at the Archaeology Institute on the UWF campus. This is a carving, a uh, profile carving of a Spanish galleon. Um, and so we don't really know what this was. It's just someone's cool carving. Um, maybe it was a child's toy. Maybe someone was just killing time. But it's on display at the Pensacola Museum of History in downtown Pensacola. Uh, we have Aztec pottery which tells us, uh, or gives us evidence of the, um, some of the indentured servants that were brought with the Spanish to act as bodyguards for the settlement. Uh, there are those black rat bones. We have stone shot, carved out of stone. Uh, ceramics or plates that would have been used for food service and preparation. Uh, we have mercury um, or quicksilver that was brought. Um, they knew by this point of arriving in Pensacola in 1559 that there was no real gold in Florida, but just in case, they brought some uh, mercury that they could use to help extract gold from ore. Um, and then everyone always asked about coins. You know, did we find any coins or anything cool like that on these shipwrecks? And the answer is not really. Again, they were coming here to settle, so they weren't bringing money or valuables. What are you going to do with it once you get here? They were bringing practical things. But there was one coin discovered on the first shipwreck. It was called a Blanca. Um, and it predates the shipwreck by about 75 years. So we think maybe it was somebody's good luck charm or a token, or perhaps it, you know, they brought it on the ship with them and then lost it in the hold. Um, so we're not quite sure what the story is behind that either. Uh, the sh second ship discovered in 2016. Here's a photo of some of our UWS students diving on that shipwreck site on our previous research platform. We have a new spiffy one now. Um, that shipwreck also yielded incredible artifacts from that period. You'll see a leather shoe sole here, um, a spoon, which doesn't sound that cool, but it's one of the oldest identified European spoons in what is now the United States, um, and also probably was a person's spoon. Um, you know, today we have a drawer full of silverware, but in the past, especially on ships, you would typically have your piece, and that is what you would use for the duration of your voyage. Uh, this one, not super exciting, but this is a plug for a barrel, right, to keep your materials in a barrel. This is a really interesting artifact. It kind of looks like a Swiss Army knife, and that's essentially what it is. It's, it's ivory. Um, and we think it's a grooming tool, so something that we, you would use to um, you know, clean your fingernails or your ears, or if you had lice in your hair, you could use to clean it. The base of it is a whistle, um, and it still works, which is pretty incredible. Ivory is a, a strong material. 
And then here's a photo from the sh third shipwreck site um, that was discovered in 2016. This site is a lot closer to shore than the other two, so the visibility on this site is actually a lot better, but they're only in about seven feet of water. And so what you're seeing here is the excavation unit, um, two of our students working, um, and then underneath her clipboard here, you can see some timbers from that shipwreck site. This is one of the better photos that we have of working on the Emanuel Point shipwreck site. All right. So those are probably our oldest and most well-known shipwrecks. The Emanuel Point wrecks are the second oldest shipwrecks, European shipwrecks in the United States. They're the oldest in Florida, uh, which is pretty incredible. The only recorded older shipwrecks in the US are in Texas, off of Padre Island, uh, which is interesting. That's a good story too. So if we move forward through time a little bit, uh, the Spanish largely abandoned their settlement attempt here in Pensacola um, after the hurricane moved through, uh, but they did come back in 1698. They really wanted Pensacola because it was part of Spanish territory, but it was also close to New Orleans and Texas, and they were worried about the French coming in from that way. So they eventually made the decision to resettle the Pensacola area, but this time they chose to establish a settlement out on Santa Rosa Island because they thought, okay, didn't work out so well back in the interior before, so we'll go on Santa Rosa Island, um, not necessarily because it's better protected, but because there's easy access to the settlement. Unfortunately, as we know, Santa Rosa Island is also subject to storms. So we have the Santa Rosa Island wreck, which based on historical records, we believe was wrecked in 1705, uh, just inside Pensacola Pass near uh, today's Gulf Islands National Seashore. Um, based on archeology span and historical records, we believe it was a 46-gun frigate, part of the Windward Fleet, so a fairly large vessel. The photos of it are beautiful that I'm gonna show in a second. Uh, but it was coming to this area to take on a load of cypress and pine log for shipment back to Mexico for shipbuilding purposes. While it was here in 1705, surprise, surprise, hurricane. Hurricane sunk the ship where it was in the shallow area off of Santa Rosa Island. Um, because it was so shallow, um, it was salvaged at the time, so the Spanish knew it was there. They you know, got whatever material off of it they could. Um, so when it was recorded first by the state of Florida in 1992, uh, there's not a whole lot of material left on it, um, but it was the subject of uh, more extensive excavation by the University of West Florida in 1999. Did you have a question? Oh, yes. Yeah, so quick, let's talk about what was on the shipwreck. No mm -hmm. weapons that I know of. Um, it was heavily salvaged, and cannon could be removed easily from shipwrecks, so they usually took those things off. Um, here's some photos of the site. So the water in this area is obviously much nicer, if you're familiar with that part of Gulf Islands. Um, so you can see some of the ballast here, some of the ship timbers. You can see the... Um, UWF students and faculty working in excavation units. This was before my time at UWF. Um, and what they're doing is essentially using these induction hoses or induction dredges to pull up sediment that would then be dumped onto a screen on board the research platform so that you could screen through it for uh, material. So what was found on here, again, it was extensively salvaged, but we do find a lot of uh, kind of parts and pieces of what was left on the ship, not necessarily valuable things. So things like these wooden shivs. Uh, this is kind of an interesting one. This is a wooden broom, broom handle with some of the, um, the fibers still attached to the end that would have made the broom. One thing that was really interesting and it was cause of kind of a hubbub, uh, not a great photo here, but you can see there's a wooden box. And so of course you see a wooden box and you're like, what's in the box? Because <laughs> even archeologists get excited about those things too, right? Not necessarily that it's treasure, but you know, what do you put in a box? It's gotta be really cool. Uh, so a local veterinarian actually, this was excavated up from the bottom. A local veterinarian offered use of his x-ray machine so that we could x-ray the box because it was heavily concreted. Whatever was inside was metal and very heavy, but you couldn't tell what it was. And so we did that. Uh, and it turned out, a box of nails. <laughs> It was a box of nails, but still very cool. These were kind of the practical things that would have been on a ship for repair and other things. Uh, so you can see the, here's the drawing of that box, and then here is the x-ray scan of that box, and then the subsequent drawing that came out of it. Very cool, very cool. 
The ship itself is really interesting because it was in part constructed, it was a new world built, so it was built in Mexico, but some of the wood used to construct the ship, you can see it's this beautiful kind of red mahogany color. Oh, man. And so you can see that in some of, particularly in this photo, the light was very good here. You can see it here a little bit, but it's in excellent preservation. It's been covered up by sand for, you know, since 1705. Um, and it also in very shallow water, only about 15 feet of water off of Gulf Islands National Seashore. Beautiful shipwreck. All right, moving forward through time. So the Spanish were here, they settled the area, but it was working so well for me. There we go. Um, but after the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, Spain had to let go of Florida, and British took, the British took control of Florida. And they created essentially two states within Florida, or two capitals. There was an East Florida with a capital in St. Augustine, and then a West Florida with a capital here in Pensacola. And so we have, because the British were only here for less than 20 years, 1763 to 1781, we have a lot less archaeology related to their time here, um, particularly shipwreck sites, but we do have a couple. And you may be familiar with this one. There's a little exhibit about it over there. Uh, so you can see some of the artifacts, but this is a Dead Man's Island wreck. And so as some of you may know, Dead Man's Island here in Gulf Breeze uh, is a very interesting and archaeologically rich place. Um, so <laughs> there we are right off of Gulf Breeze. You probably know where this is. So this was it. Oh no. Okay. So this shipwreck, what we believe, is a British sloop of war based on the archaeological and historical records, and we believe that it is probably the remains of a surveying schooner. So a surveying schooner would have been a vessel that was used to help map shoreline areas, which is something the British were very interested in because of the. Uh, for military strategic reasons. Um, and there was a particular scooter here in 1778 called HMS Florida. Um, but it wasn't surveying at the time. 1778 was right in the middle of the American Revolution. And so the British were here in Florida, but not far away was Spain uh, in New Orleans and Mobile. And Spain allied with the Americans during the American Revolution. And so the British were very worried about intrusion from Spain at the time. And so they kind of commandeered the Florida uh, to uh, essentially act as a guard outside of the pass. So watching for ships coming in, potential Spanish vessels coming into Pensacola Pass to lay siege to Pensacola, which did happen later, but not in 1778. Um, but Dead Man's Island, during the Spanish period, just before it, and during the British period, was used as a careening ground. There's fairly deep water and a nice sandy sloping beach that comes up on Dead Man's Island. Um, and so you could easily haul a vessel up to that spot, turn it over on its side, and then clean the bottom of barnacles or replace wood that had been eaten away by marine worms. Um, and so that's what Dead Man's Island was used for during the colonial period. And so this particular vessel, based on historical record, uh, was found to be unseaworthy when she was being careened on Dead Man's Island. And so they basically just kind of towed her out a little bit and let her sink in uh, Old Navy Cove there. Um, so. The shipwreck itself was first recorded by UWF in 1988, and it was actually the subject of the first underwater archaeology field school in 1989. And so here's an aerial view. Uh, the state of Florida hired a local pilot to fly over and capture some photos of them working out there. And so you can see, uh, kind of in this shaded area, the outline of that shipwreck. And then all of the students here working di diligently. Um, so very nice spot to do a field school. Um, unfortunately, because it was the first field school, it received a lot of press in local newspapers. And so, because at the time, you know, there wasn't a lot of outreach and education about archaeology, about the importance of these sites, and preserving them, and what we can learn about our history, 
Some locals who were really interested in finding treasure decided to go out to the site and tear it apart to see what they could find in terms of, oops, in terms of uh, material culture or artifacts. And so the shipwreck, right after the field school was over, right before it was about to be over, um, they went out and tore off some of the timbers. So you can see disarticulated timbers from that shipwreck site on the shore. This forlorn looking student is mapping. Um, you can also see they were kind of reaching out of things, or reaching off timbers off the shipwreck site, kind of digging into it. Um, so unfortunately it has been vandalized a good bit, but the shipwreck is still there. Um, because, yes? Did y'all save the timber? The timber? Yeah. yeah, the timber was conserved, brought to UWF and put through a conservation process. Um, but it's almost, it's, it's too big to really be put on display anywhere. You can see some of the other artifacts that were removed right. during excavation over here, um, but there's no real place for the timber to go. So it's just in the collections facility now. But you still have. Some of it, yes. Yeah. Uh, some other parts of it were reburied on the rec site. to prevent vandalism. Yeah. Well, and that, this was one of the reasons why the Florida Public Archaeology Network was formed. So if you if you don't know, FPAN, as we call ourselves, were, were formed by Judy Benz. Um, and so in 2005, we kind of became a thing. And her idea was that if we can get into local communities, talk about archaeology, kind of foster appreciation for these things, then people are more inclined to act as stewards for the site instead of thinking that there's something that they can just go and kind of pilfer through themselves. Um, trying to protect, kind of establishing a conservation ethic is the idea. And so that's why we do what we do. Good question. All right, so moving forward through time a bit, I'll go quick here. Uh, this is another one of my favorite shipwrecks. Uh, it's not in Pensacola Bay, it's just outside of Pensacola Bay. This is the shipwreck of the Catherine. So we're moving forward through time again. The British period, the British are essentially ousted by the Spanish. Um, who returned to Pensacola in 1781 because the Americans won the revolution. But over time, Spain kind of loses control. It's too much for them to operate this huge empire, and the Americans eventually come in and take Florida. Um, over time, of course, the story of you know Americans in Florida is growing commercial exploitation of local resources. And so over time, what we see is the development of the modern port of Pensacola, uh, the timber industry, fishing industry, all these other things that kind of established the Pensacola that we know and love today and the surrounding area. Um, so this shipwreck, Catherine, is kind of a relic of that period of industrial expansion in Pensacola. Um, and so this is a picture of Catherine here. She was built in Oregon in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and she was essentially what we call a tramp ship, a tramp shipper. Um, she was launched in 1870. Um, she was wooden hulled, she had three masts, and essentially what she did was travel the Atlantic world, taking on cargo wherever she could get it, and bringing it to whatever port she thought she could get the highest price for, her cargo. Um, so she would carry things like sugar, coffee, rice, um, often they were bulk cargoes. Cotton, guano was another really important one used for fertilizers. Um, in our area, the big export here was lumber. So lumber was kind of our big bulk export in the turn of the 20th century. And so eventually she was bought by another tramp sailing company in 1890. She was renamed Catherine. And in 1894, she was making her way to Pensacola to take on a load of lumber to go sell somewhere else. But again, it's a tale as old as time. She was coming into Pensacola Pass, just about to round Santa Rosa Island when there was a storm. Not a hurricane this time, but there was a bad storm. Um, and so she essentially got stranded on the shallow sand right outside of the pass in what is now Gulf Islands National Seashore. Um, the story of this is really cool. The crew was rescued. Everyone survived because it was so shallow. Um, and I've got a great picture on the next slide. And the, the wreck was salvaged, so they got a lot of the material off of it that they had on there. The wreck was first investigated by UWF in 1998. And I'll tell you the story behind that in a second. Um, so here is a picture of Catherine wrecked off of Santa Rosa Island from 1894. Now you might think that these kind of strong looking individuals are getting ready to go in and save the crew. Not true. This photo was staged for the local newspaper. Catherine actually wrecked at 4 a.m. in the morning. 
and there was a life-saving station keeper and his two teenage daughters who lived on Santa Rosa Island, and their job was to look out for shipwreck and to save any imperiled crew. And so it was the life-saving keeper, his crew, and his two teenage daughters who went out at 6 a.m. from Santa Rosa Island to go save the 18 members of the crew. Um, so these guys did nothing. They're just staging this photo. Uh, but this is Catherine here in the background. So I think this is one of the most interesting images of a shipwrecking in the Pensacola area that we have. Where should I? What's that? Where should I? I think, do I have a thing? Did I have it on the map here? She's just right. outside. No, so over time, the, you know, the site kind of arose. A lot of the upper works were removed because it's a hazard to navigation. Um, and then storms, of course, beat it up because it's so close in the surf. Um, and over time, it's not that the shipwreck becomes forgotten, it's just no longer visible. Our coastline, especially on Santa Rosa Island, is super dynamic. And so things get covered and uncovered all the time. And it was not long ago, in the 90s, that there were two divers who were fresh out of their open water certification class. And someone from UWF had come to their class and talked about underwater archaeology and the cool things that we have in our area. And so they had heard this talk. They were out there doing some, uh, you know, fun dive off of Santa Rosa Island, and they saw this sticking out of the sand. And so they did the right thing, which is actually incredible. Um, they called UWF, or they, and, and UWF got in touch with Gulf Islands National Seashore, and they investigated the site. And lo and behold, it wasn't just a single artifact. It was an entire shipwreck site. It was Catherine. And so, during UWF's investigations, they found that this little weird-looking dolphin head sticking out of the sand was actually this. It's about three feet tall. This was the, the compass binnacle for the ship. So the compass would have sat in here as the ship moved to help stabilize it. Um, so this was recovered. Again, the wreck was salvaged. There's not a whole lot on there. But we did find, uh, this is what you look for as an underwater archaeologist, the nameplate of the vessel, right? So mystery solved. We knew that this vessel had had its previous name, it was Carnarvonshire, launched in 1871 from Liverpool. Um, and this was when it was first purchased and launched and used as a tramp sailor. Um, and then some other artifacts, of course. Um, this was a porthole, brass porthole, and some other kind of small things that were found on the shipwreck site. So um, the timbers for this ship are largely still there, even if there's not a lot of artifacts or material culture. Um, so really incredible find by those two divers. And then, of course, if you boat here in Pensacola, um, or off Pensacola, if you're a diver, you probably know of USS <coughs> Massachusetts, which is uh, one of the nation's oldest battleships. And again, not in Pensacola Bay, just outside of Pensacola Pass, about a mile and a half south-ish, outside of Pensacola Pass. It's marked as a hazard to navigation. If you have a boat, you'll see it. Uh, that doesn't stop people from hitting it. Uh, but USS Massachusetts was launched in 1893 as part of the New Steel Navy. So this was the United States' way of showing off its great fleet um, right before the Spanish-American War. Um, she did see action in the Spanish-American War, not a lot, uh, but she was there, uh, and engaged in some uh, uh, battle off of Cuba. Um, eventually, after the Spanish-American War, technology, especially technology and warfare, starts changing fast. You think about changes between the Spanish-American War and then World War I and then World War II. So pretty quickly, USS Massachusetts and other battleships of the, the New Steel Navy kind of went out of, uh, not style, but they weren't the latest and greatest in technology. Um, so she eventually became used as a gunnery practice ship and a naval academy training ship before she was decommissioned in 1919 and brought to Pensacola in 1921. Because the vessel didn't have much use anymore by the end of World War I, her technology was so out of date, they decided to test a new system of artillery to sink USS Massachusetts. And you may have heard this story before. Um, but essentially what the Navy did was they wanted to build a moving system of coastal defenses. And so they would mount large guns on rail cars that could then be moved wherever there was a railway along the eastern seaboard. So they tested this in Pensacola. So they put these large guns on rail cars on the railroad just north of Warrington and Brownsville. And they lobbed these huge um, uh, ordnance at USS Massachusetts, which was parked about a mile and a half outside of Pensacola Pass. So there are really interesting newspaper articles 
about people's windows being blown out of their homes or in their local businesses because of all of this artillery and ordnance uh, that was going over their homes uh, in Brownsville and Warrington. Um, but it worked. They sank USS Massachusetts uh, in the right place, or kind of in the right place after a couple tries. Unfortunately, the vessel, um, it took them a few tries to sink it where they wanted to. Uh, it's still very close to Pensacola Pass, so if you're familiar with boating in the area, you know that it is a definitely a hazard to navigation for boats coming into Pensacola Pass. Um, and unlike most other naval ships, the title of the vessel was actually transferred to the state of Florida. The Navy doesn't typically do that, but they did this in 1956. And so today, USS Massachusetts is uh, belongs to the state of Florida. Here's some pictures of her. Um, she had this beautiful wooden deck, um, these large steel belts around her outside um, that made her very strong, but also very heavy in the water. Pictures here. There was a, a, a radio tower here. It was one of the first radio towers put on American naval vessels, particularly battleships. It was installed by Marconi himself. Um, and then, let's see, I think I've got a good photo uh, of Massachusetts sinking. There she is. And so she was transferred, her title was transferred to the state of Florida. And in 1993, she actually became Florida's fourth underwater archaeological preserve, so a museum in the sea. There are 12 of these shipwrecks around the state, um, but Massachusetts is our local shipwreck. You can see photos of her sinking here. You can see the white sandy beaches in the background. Um, today, if you go out to Massachusetts at low tide, this is you'll see this. These are the two gun turrets sticking just so above the water. Um, even though it is fairly well marked, people have a good time on the water, especially during the Blue Angels. They've had a few Coronas, too many. They're coming back in Pensacola Pass. So every once in a while you hear of people hitting the site and wrecking their boat. Actually, there, I think this past summer we had one of those. Um, so Massachusetts, I mean, although we don't encourage people to hit underwater archaeological sites, Massachusetts is a big, heavy ship. So it's going to sink the little boats. It's not going to do much damage to Massachusetts. Um, and so this is the poster that was produced as part of the preserve program. These are the 12 shipwrecks around the state. We have three here in the Panhandle and several others around the rest of Florida. Um, and you can find more information on this about this on museumsinthesea.com. Um, and I think I have a brochure for it over here on the table. And I'm sure I went over my time, so I apologize, but thank you for listening to me. <laughs> These are plans for Massachusetts, her original plans, and then the site as it was uh, when it was first recorded by the state. On that map, it didn't look like there was one in St. Augustine area. There isn't. People ask okay. about that quite a okay. bit. Well, but they were coming in the Gulf, not... Yeah, yeah, so these, the south? there are shipwrecks off of St. Augustine area, but um, all of these sites were nominated by local communities as exceptional dive sites, as places okay. that could sustain ongoing tourism to them. There's not a whole lot of that in St. Augustine. The dive community is relatively small in that area. For St. Really Castillo is very nice. Yes, well, they have lots of other cool archaeology. Over there. <laughs> yeah. And then I just put an informational slide at the end. Again, a very quick and dirty. I could spend hours talking about each of these shipwreck sites. But um, if you want more information, there's a lot on our website. We have a volunteer lab. We're always welcoming volunteers. It's going to open up next Monday, um, or two Mondays from now, sorry. Um, and then we also have our Destination Archaeology Resource Center in downtown Pensacola. We're located right in front of the fish house. Um, and we have some great resources in there as well. And there's also online, um, follow us on Facebook, on Instagram, we do all kinds of events. During the pandemic, I recorded a bunch of talks about shipwrecks and local archaeology. So if you want to hear me talk even more about archaeology, you can find all of that on our YouTube channel as well. So thank you all very much. <laughs> yes, and I'll be around if you have any questions. Yeah, I have some brochures about our organization and other kind of archaeological things of interest locally. I've also got a sign up for our newsletter list and my business card over there as well.